I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A huge break in the deadly shooting of Professor Dan Markle. And he's got blood all over his head. A newly released video confession. That was the plan, that was the deal. One of the alleged killers spilling every detail of the crime, including who he says ordered the hit. That's what I went to go kill that man for. The distraught ex-wife who was battling for custody grilled by police. Not gonna survive. Now, will his ex and her successful brother go down for ordering a murder for hire? Hey, Charlie, open the door. Let's have a conversation. Then, it's the most notorious murder case in the history of Austin. Four teenage girls executed in a yogurt shop. And he asked me, is that a body? And I, I had to step back, and it was. Two men put in prison for life for the horrible crime until a DNA test changed everything. Both convictions were overturned, then three years later, the two once convicted murderers were released. Special correspondent Narissa Knight is in Texas with our new investigation. Do you know anything about the girls' murders at the yoga shop? Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Mattel with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth, I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. We begin today with an explosive interview just released in a high-profile murder case. Dan Markle, a Florida State University professor, was gunned down in what police call a murder-for-hire plot. Now, one of the men convicted in the crime is giving up new details of who he says was behind the hit. Jason Matera is in Florida with the new details. The driver's side window is all bashed in and he's got blood all over his head. A man has been assassinated in broad daylight. Three people are now under arrest, but are they all just pawns in someone else's game? He's not responding to me. Just over a week ago, we brought you breaking news out of Florida of another arrest made in the shocking murder of criminal law professor Dan Markell, gunned down in his own driveway while talking on the phone with a friend. He didn't send an ambulance in a hurry. He's still alive. Now there's been another huge break. We're ready to proceed forward with the case. As part of a plea deal finalized just days ago. You saw me swear or affirm at the evidence you are about to give me is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, sir. One of the two men arrested for the murder has agreed to tell detectives everything he knows, and we've got the full confession. We met him right in the garage. First, he jumps out, he goes around the car, where he's driving. I think Markel was on the phone that day. Shot him twice. Got in the car, we left. Kid driving. That's Luis Rivera, the man seen in this surveillance video driving alleged trigger man Sigfredo Garcia from the hit. He says his involvement began weeks before the actual murder when he was approached by Garcia to join him on a seven hour drive from Miami to Tallahassee. I'm understanding when he was talking to me, first I thought it was gonna be like a robbery. Just a robbery. What gave you that idea? Why did you think it was gonna because be a robbery? I, I was, I'm a jack boy. Okay. I, I robbed I dro I rob drug dealers. Okay. So, so he was talking thinking, He was talking in terms of a job in Tallahassee. Mm -hmm. okay. So I'm thinking we finna go, okay, boom. But then he's like, man, it's, it's not that. We finna go, I'm finna go kill somebody, we're gonna get hired. As we now know, that somebody was beloved father of two young boys and renowned scholar Dan Markell. But just who was the person doing the hiring? Katie's the one in the middle doing everything. Put it like that. He's talking about Katie Magbadua. Good morning. Seen here just days ago during her very first court appearance. This is a uh, charge of a first degree murder capital felony case. So yes, I'm not going to do anything that would change that. Katie was also charged with Markel's murder after Rivera started talking and after police discovered she is the mother of the accused shooter's two children. Plus, in what prosecutors believe is no coincidence, she worked at a dental clinic owned and operated by the victim's in-laws, Harvey Adelson, wife Donna, and son Charlie. 
More on that connection in a moment. You'd be best to keep keep your thoughts to yourself regarding this charge. Good luck to you. According to Rivera, Katie is the one who reached out to Garcia to do the hit in the first place. But was she really the one pulling the strings? I asked him, who's hiring? He like, Katie told me this lady's gonna hire me. So he's saying Katie is the person between the woman that wants this done. Does he say the woman's name then? Not at all. But detectives have to wonder. Shortly after the murder, police zeroed in on who seemed like a logical suspect. Daniel's ex-wife, Wendy Adelson. He's not going to survive. Oh my God. During her interview with detectives, Wendy fully admits she and Markel were embroiled in a nasty divorce and custody battle over their two kids, and the rest of her family had gotten involved. According to police records, Dan's in-laws even discussed offering him a million bucks to let Wendy take the kids and move. They had squabbled over, you know, visitation rights, the involvement of her parents. It was pretty bitter. Wendy also talked about how much her brother Charlie, in particular, disliked Dan. It was always this joke. He said, I, I, you know, I looked into hiring a hitman and it was cheaper to get you this TV. Just a joke? It was enough at the time for police to take a hard look at the Adelsons. All denied their involvement and no arrests were ever made. But that was before Luis's confession. Oh, Katie's for a He says Katie manipulated her baby daddy, Sigfredo Garcia, into doing the crime. She had him crazy. You know, she would go cheat on him and I guess she told him, if you want me back, you gotta go do this. She had them all messed up. She had them all confused, so. Confused in particular about Katie's current relationship. What was Katie doing? I mean, you said somebody, she was going to see somebody. Oh, she did go see the dentist. Who's the dentist? That dentist, police allege, was none other than Charlie Adelson. The brother, Wendy Adelson, once said joked about hiring a hitman. And that's not all. Charlie was also Magmanua's employer and boyfriend at the time of the murder and the man who, not long after the killing, helped her purchase brand new breast implants. Suspicious, the Tallahassee Police Department even set up an elaborate sting to see what the Adelsons might know. You see he's talking to her now? That's Wendy's mom, Donna Adelson, being approached by an undercover agent posing as a friend of Garcia's. According to documents, he hands her a paper saying he knows about the hired hit and wants $5,000 to keep quiet. Donna Adelson looks rattled. Cops say within minutes she calls her son Charlie. Police claim Charlie then calls Catherine, and according to a probable cause affidavit, Charlie says, quote, you better kill him because he's going to be a big problem. And, quote, if you can't do it, I'll have someone else do it. At the time, the Tallahassee Police Department drafted arrest affidavits for Charlie Adelson and his mom, Donna. But state prosecutors didn't approve their arrests, saying they still didn't have enough evidence to link the Adelsons to Dan Markell's death. But again, that was before Rivera started talking. And before detectives heard about this very telling question, Rivera says he asked Garcia before the hit. I asked him, why are you going to kill this guy? Because the lady wants her two kids back. She won full custody of them kids because he, he had all the custody. That was the, that was the plan, that was the deal. That's where we went to go kill that man for. It seemed as though he could only be talking about one person, but detectives still needed a name and they were about to get it. Here, Rivera recalls cruising around Markel's neighborhood on the morning of the murder and being spotted by a woman and her two kids. I'm looking to my rear mirror and I ask, Garcia, Man, what's up with this lady? Why is she looking so much? She's like, oh, that's that lady. That's Wendy. You go by, you saw her walking the kids. Mm -hmm. You ask him, he says, that's Wendy. Okay. That's the conversation. So it's not a question of if it's Wendy. He already knows it's Wendy. Oh, he's already knows it's Wendy. If Rivera is telling the truth, as he has officially sworn to do, he just implicated none other than Wendy Adelson, Dan Markell's ex-wife. Because of previous testimony made by Rivera, Katie Magbanua is now behind bars. And with this new confession, the case against Sigfredo Garcia, who has pleaded not guilty to the murder, seems stronger than ever. But could other arrests be right around the corner?
After Magbanua's court appearance, State Prosecutor Georgia Kappelman had this to say. Obviously, you have, you have Mr. Rivera as a witness. What is your hope now? Uh, my hope now is to proceed with the cases I have in front of me, which of course are the one against Mr. Garcia and now Ms. Magbanua. You still need a link to the family is what I've, I've seen you quoted as saying. Yes, if I was to charge, be able to charge a member of the family as being implicated as part of the conspiracy, I think it, I would require a witness such as possibly Ms. Magbanua. But you're obviously going to be trying to talk to her, so. If her lawyer allows me to, I will, but we don't know that yet. So just what does the near future look like for the people currently behind bars? Or for that matter, the Adelsons? A jury will have to believe Luis Rivera, and we're going to beat him up pretty good. Coming up. These are dentists. These aren't the Sopranos, okay? What the other side has to say, and an explosive new document hinting more arrests may be coming soon. It's always the wife, the wife's family. Now back to our investigation into the murder for hire plot that left Florida State University professor Dan Markle dead. Here's Jason Matera. Chris, one of the men arrested after the murder recently sat down with investigators and told them everything including some shocking claims about who was actually in on the hit. If confessed killer Luis Rivera is telling the truth, Dan Markell's own ex-wife, Wendy, may have financed the hit that took his life. You said before something about you knew that the total amount equaled $100,000 or something. Yeah, he gave me 37 in total. Then I asked him, how much you getting? You got like 40 something. I told him, we should just go rob her. But in another surprising reveal, Rivera goes on to say in this taped confession with police that the murder almost didn't happen. He and the accused trigger man, Sigfredo Garcia, almost never even made it to their destination. I'm in probation, man. If we get pulled over, I'm gonna go to jail. And we get pulled over. Okay. So the day we get pulled over, the, the officer grabbed my license, came back, gave me tickets, like slow down, put the seatbelt. Give me a speaking ticket. And I'm on my I looked at Garcia and told him, this will take me to jail. So you got a ticket in the Prius on the way up here. The way up here. Rivera says it was enough to make him want to abort. But when we get pulled over, I tell him, yo, this is a sign, man. We should just turn around. He's like, nah, man, that we up here. So we jumped to the last. But according to Rivera, the hitmen would get one more chance to reconsider when just a day before the murder, they were driving through town, Garcia allegedly high on cocaine. Um, Garcia, I don't know why, I don't know what he was playing, the, I don't know why he was playing with a gun, I don't know what the f he was doing. I heard, I'm driving, boom, I'm gonna jump. Like, Yo, what's up, man? Y'all right? Seconds later, that now infamous green Prius stuttered to a stop. I was just laughing because he's so stupid on like, we took this car, like, oh man, I don't know. I said, we don't got no gas. How the hell we don't got no gas? So I, we stopped, he looked under, he's like, oh, there's a line. I said, you shot the line? Are you serious? Unfortunately for Dan Markell, the men were able to fix the car and continue on their deadly path. But now, Luis Rivera is telling everything to police. Could his words help prosecutors take down who they believe may be the real masterminds? All rise and come to order. Court is now in session. The Honorable Judge J. Lane Smith presiding. Good morning, everyone. You can take your seats. In a probable cause affidavit for Catherine Magbanua released to Crime Watch Daily, prosecutors lay out their theory of the murder. After her divorce from Markell, it's alleged Wendy Adelson and her parents, Harvey and Donna Adelson, as well as her brother, Charlie, were determined to relocate Wendy's two Markell children to South Florida. The report goes on to show a series of back and forth calls between various members of the Adelsons and Catherine Magbanua in the hours before and after the murder. In addition, the record shows that since Markell's murder, Magbanua's bank account has grown by at least $56,000, mostly in cash deposits. And she got a new car, a used Lexus registered to Harvey Adelson. We reached out to Magbanua's attorney for comment, but got no response. In the affidavit, authorities do say that Wendy was initially cooperative with the police, but that the day after Markell's memorial service in Tallahassee, 
the entire Adelson clan left with the kids to South Florida, promptly changed the children's last names to Adelson, and haven't spoken to investigators since. Our producers did try to contact Wendy's lawyer, but have yet to receive a reply. So we tracked down accused shooter Sigfredo Garcia's attorney to get the defense's side of the story. Everyone here is under the assumption that the Markel, that the Adelsons hired Rivera and Sigfredo to commit this murder, okay? Because that's what's sexy. It's always the wife, the wife's family. I don't think the Adelson family would organize a hit on their former son-in-law to have the grandkids closer? These are dentists. These aren't the Sopranos, okay? They're not gonna go whack a guy for, you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. What is the connection then? What is Sigfredo and Luis's connection then to Dan Markel? I'll tell you in trial. In addition to those comments, we reached out to Charlie Adelson's attorney who declined to be interviewed at this time but who did release this statement to the press regarding Rivera's new plea deal. The prosecution admittedly didn't have enough evidence, so went out and bought some by giving away the farm to a murderer. Seven years is just offensive. That's not a search for the truth, that's a deal with the devil. And to that, prosecutors don't necessarily disagree. I'm not necessarily all that pleased with uh, making any kind of deal with a uh, murder suspect, but we've heard it said many, many times before, if you're going to try the devil, you'd have to go to hell to get your witnesses. My hands up and everyone ever killed nobody. I don't beat people with bad head with sticks, like that. I want to have enough to shoot somebody for some kids, man. Now, this witness's testimony could be used to bring down everyone responsible for the cold-blooded murder of Dan Markell. We went to Charlie Adelson's house to get his side of the story. Hey, Charlie, what role did you have in Dan Markell's murder? I hear you. You're talking about, open the door. Let's have a conversation. Oh, you're, you're calling the police? Charlie says he's going to be calling the police on us. Funny thing is, the police may be calling them. And as it so happens, there are small hints that they may be coming soon. In an email released by the prosecutor's office and sent by Dan Markell's mother to state prosecutor Georgia Kappelman, she seems to think that something that would require Dan Markell's two children to be moved from their mother Wendy's house may be happening soon. Dan's mother writes, We thank you for moving the plea bargaining process forward. As the situation evolves, we need a tight plan for emergency placement due to arrests. Emergency placement of the kids? And just what arrests could she be talking about? To date, no one in the Adelson family has been charged, and lawyers for the family have denied any involvement in Dan's murder. We will, of course, follow this case very closely and bring you the very latest should prosecutors decide to file any charges against Markle's ex-wife or any of her family members. Coming up, firefighters respond to a yogurt shop blaze, then make a horrific discovery. It's a foot that I saw. That's when I knew we had a crime scene. Four young girls shot dead. It will become the biggest murder case in Austin history. Crime Watch Daily with an all-new investigation into the horrific crime after the men who were convicted of the murders are set free. That's next. It's the most notorious murder case in the history of Austin, Texas. Four young girls murdered, their bodies and the store set ablaze. But what sets this case apart is what's happened since that day, including a controversial decision to let two convicted killers out of prison. Our special correspondent, Narissa Knight, is in Texas now with our story, The Yogurt Shop Murders. Inside this burning building, one of the most horrific crimes you'll ever hear about the charred bodies of four teenage girls, all shot in the head. One of the biggest mysteries haunting Austin, Texas, who killed these girls? Does the man who lives here know what happened the night the yogurt shop burned down? The folks who crowd the busy sidewalks of Austin still talk about the yogurt shop murders. It was the night Austin lost its innocence and 13-year-old Amy Ayers lost her life. There hadn't been a single day that she hadn't crossed my mind, ever. Some days are better, some days are worse. 
Sean Ayers has never publicly talked about his little sister Amy, the youngest of the victims, until now on Crime Watch Daily. If you could tell us who Amy was, just introduce us to your little sister. First and foremost, animal lover. I mean, that was animals were her life, uh, especially horses and cats. It was just before 11 p.m. closing time. Amy and her friend Sarah Harbison were visiting their friends at the yogurt shop. Sarah's sister Jennifer and Eliza Thomas worked there behind the counter. Sonora Thomas remembers how excited her sister was to be working. Oh, she loved it. She loved working there. She loved making her own money. She bought a car. She had a green Carmen Ghia that my dad was helping her repair. She was my older sister, so I really looked up to her. And so she was kind of my stable rock. At 11.03, three minutes after Eliza and Jennifer closed for the night, the cash register rings up a no sale. Cops believe that's when the suspects grabbed the money and unleashed an almost unthinkable terror. Police say the girls were bound and gagged with their own clothes. Amy was sexually assaulted. Then the monsters shot each girl execution style in the head with a 22 caliber gun. The killers lit a match and most of the evidence went up in smoke. Initially, when the police officers spotted smoke and the firefighters were called in, it was thought to be a kitchen fire at a chain establishment. However, after hundreds of gallons of water were used to douse the three alarm blaze, two firefighters stumbled upon a horrific scene. It's a foot that I saw. That's when I knew that you know, we, we had a crime scene. What Rene Garza says he found will send chills down your spine. Garza was one of the first firefighters who discovered the bodies. He's also speaking out for the first time. Literally, you guys stumbled upon the bodies. I'm sure we walked on them. The firefighter with me tapped me on the shoulder and pointed down. And he asked me, is that a body? And I, I had to step back, and it, it was. I saw another body. I knew that, that it wasn't right. Something was not right. When I step back to see what what it is that am I actually seeing this, which was a body face down, arms tied behind the back. The bodies of three of the girls were stacked on top of one another. Amy, apparently still alive, pulled herself up and tried to crawl to safety. Her final moments, sheer terror. She was pistol whipped, then shot again with a 38. The second bullet was fatal. What has this incident, this horrific scene done to you? Uh, it's just shock. Um, heart drop is a good way to put it. Just, I, I can't believe that I'm seeing this. I'm a quiet person generally, but um, uh, immediately after the incident, uh, you, you can't help but relive those images. And I still see the images. Sean's mother, Pam, tearfully recalls that fateful visit from police. Early that morning, uh, the doorbell rang, and I looked at my bedroom window and saw police cars. The next thing was I asked, did we have a daughter named Amy? I said, yes. And then my next thought was, had she been raped? I never dreamed that we were gonna talk about murder. And then they said uh, there had been a fire. And that, and then at that point, then I thought, well, she's burned. And then they said, we're sorry to tell you that she was dead. The Austin cops worked tirelessly to solve this case. Witnesses recall seeing two mystery men sitting at one of the tables. Who were they? Eight days later, cops arrested Maurice Pierce for brandishing a 22 caliber pistol at a nearby mall. Pierce told cops he and three buddies stole a car and went on a joy ride the day after the murders. I would describe them as, as boys that, that had troubles. The ballistic tests were inconclusive. They couldn't connect Pierce's gun to the killings. The biggest murder case in Austin history soon grew cold. It is likely that the perpetrators of this crime entered the building and the motive has been speculated uh, as robbery. Eight years passed. 
Then, Detective Jay Swan's cold case squad dug through the evidence and took a fresh look at the investigation. At the Austin Police Department, there's a scale model of the murder scene, including the mall and yogurt shop. Thousands of hours have been spent on the quadruple murder case, and there's a mountain of evidence, including this wall of files. Detective Swan showed me the scale model. We've constructed a removable top that shows the, the layout of the store uh, as it would have been uh, at the time, showing, of course, the counter and the seating in the front, and then some of the things in the back of the store as well. Swan says the evidence led them to the four guys they suspected all along, Maurice Pierce and his three friends. Next, cops bring them in, in for questioning setting their sights on a confession to murder. Is that the gun you walked up behind somebody with and shot in the head? Now back to our investigation into the yogurt shop murders, four particularly gruesome killings that dominated headlines in Austin, Texas. As special correspondent Nerissa Knight reports, after years of searching, detectives are zeroing in on their suspects. Chris, four suspects to be exact, and investigators would push hard for a confession maybe a little too hard. It was closing time in the yogurt shop when death walked in the door. The cold-blooded killer shot four young girls, including 13-year-old Amy Ayers. I envisioned her that night with that, that panic look and knowing nobody was there to help her. The horrified city of Austin rallied around the families. The mother of Sarah and Jennifer Harbison wanted justice. I still I can't imagine that this happened and it happened to my girls. Even after all these years, sometimes it's, it's not okay. And police really wanted to solve this case, but the biggest hurdle, the killers had covered up evidence by setting the yogurt shop ablaze. What makes this case difficult as far as the hurdles that the first responders and you had to conquer with the fire? Of course, you have a couple of issues. One is the destruction of evidence. Given the extreme heat of the fire, the other would be contamination. Just given the volume of water that was inside of the crime scene and that water can, can very easily cause contamination. The case went cold, but finally, after an exhaustive investigation, the cops had their break. Four suspects, the four investigators initially suspected, Maurice Pierce and his friends Robert Springsteen, Michael Scott, and Forrest Wellborn. Do you think that Maurice Pierce was the ringleader? It is my belief that Maurice Pierce was definitely the ringleader. He was the one with the personality that was so charismatic that the others would have followed his lead. Scott voluntarily spoke to cops in Austin, but things inside the interrogation room are about to get heated. The detective puts a gun to Scott's head, demonstrating the police theory of what happened. Is that the gun you shot somebody with, Mike? I don't. Is that the gun you walked up behind somebody with and shot in the head? Is that the one? Talk to me, Mike. Yes, sir. You did that, didn't you? Yes, sir. By this time, Springsteen had moved to West Virginia. After Scott's confession in Austin, detectives questioned Springsteen at the police station in Charleston. What did Maurice make you do with that 380? Huh? What did he tell you to do? Just that try and what's going to happen? What did you do? What's wrong? Both men confessed their stories similar, telling cops that after casing the joint, they returned later that night through the back door off the alley. With those confessions and other evidence, all four men were charged with murder. But Maurice Pierce, the alleged ringleader, was released after the charges were dismissed due to a lack of evidence. He was later killed in an unrelated incident with police, and a grand jury failed to indict Forrest Wellborn, citing a lack of evidence. Springsteen and Scott recanted their confessions and pleaded not guilty. They went to trial. What is the travesty in all this? Amy's parents, Pam and Robert, endured the unthinkable task of viewing the crime scene photos on full display in the courtroom. What things were the most difficult? One thing particular I think about is there were some blood spatters on the wall. 
and Amy's injuries, and uh, they were really, really rough on her. I mean, they they beat her with a gun, and also shot her twice. So she went through a lot before she actually died, and that was really hard. Uh, she was strangled also. Amy's brother Sean says his emotions during the trial exploded into sheer anger. He says he wanted to exact his own brand of Texas justice. What emotions were running through you during that trial and when those guys were sitting feet away? I can remember his eyes, and it just, there wasn't nothing there. I mean, it took back everything I had to stay in my seat. Anger, rage, I mean, wanting to tear their heads off. I mean, kill them, it ain't gonna do me no good. So be in prison. Both men were convicted. Scott sentenced to life in prison. Springsteen sentenced to death row. Case closed. Justice served, right? Not quite. Next, the court decision that rocks Austin and leaves a grieving family in emotional ruin. This son of a bitch wants to come back and try to say he's innocent. DNA, it's often the key piece of evidence that helps lock up a suspect. But in the case of the yogurt shop murders in Austin, Texas, new DNA evidence has clouded up a once closed investigation. Our Narissa Knight has more on that and the court ruling that turned this case on its head. The two men convicted in the gruesome yogurt shop murders were locked away in prison, seemingly forever. But in Austin, Texas, forever, lasted less than a decade. The girls' families felt some sense of closure with the convictions and sentencings of Michael Scott, life in prison, and Robert Springsteen, the death penalty. But that somewhat comfort of conviction was shattered in 2006 when both convictions were overturned. Then three years later, the two once convicted murderers were released. In a shocking turn, both Springsteen and Scott walked out of the courthouse free men. Amy Ayer's brother, Sean, is outraged. They shouldn't be there in the first place. I mean, they should be where they belong. Where's that? In prison or dead, one or two. I, mean, I don't care. I mean, they took something from my family and a lot of people. Why did they go free? The reasons were legal, but some might say morally unjust. The appellate court ruled that the men's constitutional right to confront each other's claims was violated. But after that controversial decision, there were other factors that came to light, scientific ones. Years after the murders, advanced DNA testing revealed a bombshell. New results showed the DNA found on Amy didn't match any of the suspects and didn't match anyone in the nationwide database. Then another shocker. I believe it would be imprudent and in fact unfair to proceed to trial at this time. It would be unfair to the jury hearing the case, unfair to our community, and most of all, unfair to the victims of these devastating crimes and their families. In a stunning decision, Travis County DA Rosemary Lindbergh announced she won't retry the case until they find out who that mystery DNA belongs to. Author Beverly Lowry says the key to unlocking the case, those two mystery men who were in the shop before it closed. The strongest theory I have is whoever those two guys were, they were there to wreak havoc. Lowry has intensely followed the case of the yogurt shop murders, and in Who Killed These Girls, she presents the mystery men theory. Beverly says one giant clue, an unopened can of Coke. What about this unopened Coke can that was on the counter next to the register? Well, again, this is a theory that one of these guys may have gone to the cash register, asked for Coke. She had to lean down, get the Coke hand, and that perhaps when she did that, the man was there with a the gun. Now the tables have turned in another direction. Springsteen is taking the city to court to clear his name. Robert Springsteen is now suing the city of Austin for $700,000. The girl's family say that adds salt to their gaping wounds, insult to their deepest injuries. You want to kill my sister and then come back and try to get paid for it? That ain't going to work. He should never get any money because if he does, then the state of Texas had just paid him to murder four girls, period. 
Travis County prosecutors are hesitant to declare Springsteen innocent, in part because they still consider him a suspect in the murders and subject to new charges. Springsteen's attorney, Broda Spidey, says his client is not only innocent, he wasn't even at the yogurt shop the night of the murders. There's not a single piece of actual evidence that ties these boys with the scene. Why would he confess to a murder he didn't commit? It involves questioning a person and, and dropping hints and suggestions to that person and telling them such things as we have a statement from somebody else that says you did it, now you should come clean. It would be a lot easier on you if you just confess. But at some point you begin to agree with the interrogator just to get it over with. And what about Springsteen's friend, Forrest Wellborn, the man who was once thought to be involved but had the charges dropped due to lack of evidence? We have information that suggests that Forrest Wilborn lives in that house. There is a car, an SUV in the driveway under the carport. There was no answer. We were only left with the empty sound of wind chimes. We were here last night, but no answer. However, neighbors confirm that Forrest Wellborn's relatives do live here. We're going to try once more to catch up with him. Oh, wow. Hi, are you Forrest Wellborn? Are you Jimmy Wellborn? I'm Narissa Knight with Crime Watch Daily. We're wondering if uh, Forrest Wellborn lives here. Do you know anything about the girls' murders at the yogurt shop? No. Not at all. Did your brother have anything to do with it? Wellborn has consistently denied he was involved in the killings, and he was never tried in court because there was no evidence connecting him to the crimes. I had a lot of contempt for the law and courts and the whole procedure because when they say criminal law, it's exactly what it means. It's for the criminal. It's not for the victims. It's the crime the city of Austin will never forget. No justice for Eliza, Sarah, Jennifer, or Amy. Somebody is still getting away with murder. Right now to help us break down this complicated case is criminal defense attorney Diana Eisman in our Los Angeles office. Diana, the defense claimed coercion, but detectives say these guys knew details only the killers would know. What's your take on the case? Chris, any time that you have a situation where you have a suspect being interrogated over several hours and they're not given the opportunity to take breaks, they're not given the opportunity to drink water, they're being sleep deprived, you can't trust the information that you're getting from them. Diana, I get what you're saying about coercion, but these two guys had nearly identical statements about what happened that night. I think a lot of people would say, okay, maybe they got one guy falsely to confess, but two guys? Come on now, what are the chances of that? Absolutely, I totally understand what you're saying there, and the problem I have with that is DNA. If there was actual truth to these statements, there would be some sort of physical evidence to tie these boys to the crime, but there isn't. The problem that we have when you have this type of an interrogation That's technique that is long, arduous, and extremely grueling. Is that the gun you walked up behind somebody with and shot in the head? Talk to me, man. Yes, sir. Information is released by law enforcement during the course of that interrogation, and they're being asked to agree or disagree in a lot of ways. And so that might be the reason why you have consistent versions of the events from two different suspects. With everything that I've reviewed, there is not enough evidence to find proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Now we have Springsteen suing the state for wrongful conviction, but prosecutors are saying he's still a suspect. Is there any chance he wins this civil case? It's really hard to win that type of a lawsuit. So you would have to show that the prosecutors knew that he was innocent or should have known that he was innocent and brought the charges anyway. And there isn't enough evidence to sustain a finding like that. Diana Eisman, thank you so much for your insight. Thanks for having me. We will, of course, continue to follow this case and bring you the very latest here on Crime Watch Daily.